As soon as I stop worrying, worrying how the story is, and I'll let go, and I'll let go, I'll let God have his way. That's when things start happening. And I'll stop looking at back then. And I'll let go. And I'll let God. I'll let God have his way. I couldn't seem to fall asleep. There was so much on my mind. Searching for that peace, the peace I could not find. Oh, but then I kneeled down to pray. Pray, Lord, help me, please. But he said, you don't have to cry. I'll supply all your needs. Help me, y'all. As soon as I stop worrying, as soon as I stop worrying, how the story then I let go. Let go. Looking at back then, then I let go. Then I let go. Then I let go. I let go. Now there's so much going on. Sometimes I can't find my way. And oftentimes I struggle, I struggle from day to day. I had to realize that it's not my battle, the battle is not mine. I had to know if I put it in his hands that every Stop worrying. Then I let go. I let go. I let go. That's when things I stop looking at back then. Just let go and let go, let go and let go, just let go. Let 
let go. Let go. And let go. Let go. And let go. Come on, give God praise in the house this morning. As the music continues to play softly. That's a message for all of us in the house today. To let go and let God. What are you wrestling with? What's wrestling with you? What are you dealing with that's greater than you can handle? What you need to know today is that not only does God see and God knows, but God can handle it. But you have got to cast your cares upon him for the record is he careth continuously for you and I know there are times you feel like you're in it all by yourself and nobody knows the heartaches the pain the fears, the troubles, the secrets, the, the issues underneath your own skin. And, and sometimes it's, it's more than you can bear alone. But Jesus is right there waiting on you to invite him in. Behold, he says, I stand at the door and knock. Why are you knocking, Jesus? Because I want to come in and fellowship with you. I, I want to come in and, and help you. I want to come in and bless you. But you've got to open the door for me and let me in. Now, we usually have ministers, prayer warriors, and deacons and deaconess line the altar to pray. But I want you to pray this morning. Because the truth of the matter is, can't nobody tell him for you like you can tell him for you what you really need, what you really want. Oh, you might come up there and tell them some things, but you, you never really tell them all and sometimes you never even tell them what's really wrong because it's too burdensome for you and sometimes you're too embarrassed to tell them but isn't it good to know that you don't have to hide anything from the Lord you you already know he knows but when you confess your sins he is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Heads are bowed and just for a minute or so 
You don't have to play long, pray long to pray strong. Just tell him afresh. So, but pastor, I've already told him, but tell him again. Tell him in his house. Tell him even now. It's your time to talk to him. He's going to talk to you in a few minutes, but, but you have the privilege. And while you're talking to him, remember the song, Then I Stop Worrying. I let go and I let God. All the stuff that's in the past is in the past. But you got to be the one to release the past from you and look forward to the best that is yet to come. You've got to be the one to tell the Lord, Lord, I release this situation from my life. I turn it over to you. I forsake it and I trust you. You've got to tell him what you want. Mm, bless him. Bless him. Talk to him. Tell him. Tell him. While you're praying, pray for the bereaved. Pray for those who are going through right now. Pray for those who are sick and convalescent. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let go. Let God. Let go. answer him God as only you can thank you thank you thank you thank you in Jesus name we pray amen and amen come on give him praise if you know he heard and answered your prayer even in advance Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lamb of God. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. Soon as I stop worrying. Soon. Soon. Yeah. Listen, will you look at your neighbor and say to me, say to them for me, neighbor, are you telling the Lord about your problems and then letting them go? If you are, rejoice with me. For this is the day which the Lord hath made. 
And we shall rejoice. We shall rejoice. And be glad in it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ooh, glory to God. Don't 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 let don't let the problems keep you down. Don't let the pressures keep you down. Don't let people keep you down. Not when you got the presence of the Lord who can hear and answer every prayer. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Gracious God, our Father, we thank you now as we prepare to hear your word speak to our hearts afresh. Don't allow the familiarity of the text cause us to miss the message that you have for us afresh. God, we give you praise, glory, and honor for what you shall share with us this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The scriptures were read in your hearing in our devotional lesson this morning, Mark chapter 5, beginning at verse 25 through verses 34. Now, I'm not going to read those scriptures or have you read them again. You know the story. It's a very familiar story. It is the woman with the issue of blood. But I, I want to deal more in details today because the story is inspiring, the story is informative, but yet there are not many of us who have much insight about the going-ons in the story. And I want to share some of the going-ons in the story because we miss many times the message that is really trying to be uh, conveyed for seeing only the miracle. And every miracle, every wonder, and every sign points to far something far larger than itself. And Mark, uh, the second of the gospel writers uh, portrays Jesus in this vein so that we can understand Mark is the shortest of the gospel accounts and yet Mark attaches to his record the immediacy of Jesus and his ministry the immediacy Mark is the only gospel writer who uses the word and immediately 41 times and immediately Mark presents a sense of urgency about the matter of the master and one of the things that one scholar has pointed out that even though he says 41 times immediately that the times he did not say immediately he dealt with the situation or the circumstance at once so in other words mark gives us the impression that jesus didn't waste time and he didn't have time to lose with those who did not want anything or were not going anywhere or who did not desire anything of him. And so Mark does two focuses for us. One, he focuses on uh, the identification of the Messiah, the identification of the Messiah. But then secondly, he focuses on the intricacies of his mission, his mission. Two main focuses. One, every miracle that Jesus did, all of the ministry that Jesus did was pointing to the fact of his identity as the Messiah who had come, the Christ, the anointed one, the one God had sent to restore the lost sheep of Israel, the lost house 
of Israel, the people of God who had strayed away from God. Jesus had come to recall them and to reclaim them. And Mark makes clear that every miracle he did, and many of them were on Sundays, or the Sabbath, I should say, uh, and of course, it appeared as though he was dishonoring the Sabbath when Mark is the only writer who calls out the fact that Jesus said that Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. In other words, uh, it's important for Jesus to make clear to them that what he was there to do was to show them that he was Lord over all. And even in the biblical account of the Old Testament, uh, it made room on a Sabbath to save a life on a Sabbath. While work was not uh, permitted, saving a life was. And Jesus had to institute the fact that human life, healing and helping and making it whole on a Sabbath day was the greatest way to honor God. But yet those who played like they were holy and who went through the motions like they were holy saw the law higher than the lawgiver. And so what I think about Mark is, in this context, Mark is showing us that Jesus is walking into the role of his messiahship so that men will see him as the messiah. And then, of course, that's the first half of the gospel. The second half of the gospel deals with the intricacies of his mission. The ultimate reality of every miracle and every sign and every wonder and every ministry he did was pointing to the fact that he was coming ultimately to save. And yet to save, sometime he had to help folk out of situations so they could understand he was the savior. And now we get to this story, this very familiar story. One of the things that I always point out is when it says a certain man or a certain woman, means that it was a true story. Uh, the names were not highlighted so that the principles could be spotlighted. If you held on to the name, that would become more of the story than the principles of the story. So the word just says a certain woman had an issue of blood. Now, she had the hemorrhaging underneath the skin it was a bleeding that took place uh, that made her unclean. According to the Mosaic law, she had to go at least 300 feet uh, in the presence of people shouting unclean, unclean. Why? Because she was plagued and it was a contagious disease. Uh, some writers suggest and so just like leprosy uh, that was contagious and spreadable uh, obviously the plague she had uh, to some degree was either uh, similar or certainly qualified as being unclean and of course according to Jewish law if you touched anything unclean then you yourself would become unclean, whether in reality or ceremonially, you were then unclean. So she had to give everybody within the sound of her voice the opportunity to know that she was coming. And they would split and let her come in because nobody wanted to be close to her. Now this woman lived this way for 12 long years what is interesting is Mark conjoins two stories together. And 
Jesus was on his way to the ruler Jairus' house when the woman found Jesus. And so Jairus, the ruler, had come, fell down on his face before Jesus and asked him to come and heal his daughter who was on her deathbed. And uh, he begged Jesus to come to his house. So Jesus was on his way to the house. But in the midst of him being on the way to J. Iris' house, uh, whose daughter was 12 years old at the time. This is interesting because when I looked at it, you look at the daughter was 12 years old and the woman had suffered an issue of blood for 12 long years. And the woman who had suffered the issue of blood for 12 long years said, I've been going through as long as you've been living, proverbially. And so I can't wait till you go to his house and heal his daughter. I need my blessing right now. And see, there are some of you who can wait on your blessings. But then there are others of you who can't wait another moment longer. And your faith is commensurate with the fact that you waited on a blessing and it seemed like it just won't come. You, you waited on deliverance and it seems it just won't come. But then when it won't come to you, you got to have the kind of faith to go to it. And this woman demonstrates, listen, I've waited long enough. I've gone from doctor to doctor to doctor to doctor. From one physician, from one doctor, from one quack, from one supposedly healer, and none of them could do me any good. And you know, my brothers and sisters, when we are dealing with something that seems to be an incurable or a very difficult thing to cure, we'll get a second opinion or a third opinion or sometime like the woman a fourth opinion. And every one of those opinions cost us something. One scholar said that she was a great woman. I had a great household, which meant that she was well off. But when she got through trying to get healed in those 12 years, it was she was not only a broken woman inside, but she was a broken woman financially because of her pursuit of health. Health costs was high back even in Jesus' day. Listen, so she heard, the Bible says, all this is in 25 to 34. She heard of Jesus. What did she hear? No doubt she heard of his many miracles, many signs, many wonders. What does the Bible say? Romans 10, 17. So then, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Jesus Christ is the word personified. He's the word in the flesh. So when they talked about Jesus, they were talking about the word. John 1 and 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God and the word was God and the same too and the same was with God in the beginning that's Jesus Jesus all things verse 3 were made by him and without him was nothing made that was made and she heard about Jesus now listen at her faith if I could but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made, excuse me, I shall be whole. 
made was left out. I shall be whole. That's her confession. That's her profession. That's her belief. That's her conviction. If I touch him, Jairus was waiting on him to touch his daughter. The woman said, I can't even come around him if I listened to the law. I'd have to shout out, unclean, unclean, and no respecting Jew would touch or be around anything that was unclean. So the woman had to take her chances. I believe he can do what I need him to do, but I've got some folk around him blocking my blessings. The press meant there were great crowds of people thronging him around him. How do I get to him? See, the woman had to strategize. And listen, one of the things about faith is seeing the end at the beginning. If I but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be whole. Now here is the problem. I got to touch him. I ain't got no doubt I'll be whole, but my problem is getting to him. So what's the best way to get to him? Do I shout unclean, unclean, and make a way? Through the pressing throng and crowd, or do I just get down on my knees and crawl up behind him. You see, the most of the call, uh, the crowd, were circling Jesus, but the majority of the people were in the front to the side. The greatest opening was behind him. And the woman, not wanting to be seen, got down on her knees. Can, can I tell you, when you want a blessing, you don't always have to be seen to get your blessing. You just know, need to know what to do and do it. N notice she didn't tell nobody else. Sometime you need to keep your business to yourself and do what you have to do. And when it's all over, you can shout the glory and tell the story. But sometimes you've got to keep your business to yourself and just do what you've got to do. So she gets on her knees. And even if there were folk around her, can you imagine you standing in the crowd and somebody touch your leg? You move like, what is going on here? What is this person doing? And you move and you make room for her. She didn't care about what they said. She didn't care about what she thought. She just wanted to get to Jesus. And she gets to Jesus. She doesn't grab his hand. She didn't ask him to lay hands on her. She didn't ask him to anoint her with oil. She didn't ask him for anything. She said, if I but touch his garment, the record is the hem of his garment, I shall be whole. And she did it. She did it. She did it. Before Nike came out with the saying, just do it, she did it. And that's what we've got to learn how to do. Just do it. Stop putting all of that stuff around it, cloaking it in all of this unbelief, trying to psych yourself up. If you really believe it, just do it. And she did it. And when she did it, she felt the flow of blood stop in her. 
Why? Because she made the connection with the God who was able to heal her. She touched what others thought was untouchable. Her faith gave her access to Jesus while others were thronging and touching him and got nothing. Her fingers touched his garment, but her faith touched his heart. She was able to get from Jesus through faith with people pulling on him and throwing on him couldn't get because their touch was faithless. Her touch was faith filled. It was filled with faith, full of faith. And when she touched him, Jesus felt her touch. Now, keep in mind, she didn't touch Jesus. She touched his garment, the clothes hanging on Jesus. But the old preacher used to say, there's more medicine in the hem of his garment. And back then in those days, they say, then in a drugstore in town. We call it pharmacies today, but it was drugstore back then. And that was so true because the anointing of Jesus was so powerful, but it connected two things together. Her faith with his power. Her faith with his power. She couldn't do it, but he could. But he couldn't have faith for her, so she had to have faith for herself. She didn't have no more money. She didn't have no more friends. She didn't have no free family with her. All she had was her faith. And it was her faith that made her her faith. Now, that's all wonderful because we know all of that part. But what we don't know, all of that was my introduction. Now I'm going to get to my message. What, 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 what was she and many of us did not realize is the aftermath of the healing. You see, so much of us are consumed with the miracle that we missed the message in and after the miracle. It really is all about Jesus. Jesus in this one instance combined what Mark reveals as the Messiah and the mission in this one single act. Well, how did he do that? Well, let, let me take a moment and break this down. And he said unto her, directly when he asked who touched my garment the disciple says you kidding right they want to really say Jesus are you tripping all these people grabbing on you and, and you ask who touched me Jesus is like no you miss it you miss it I'm not talking about people putting their hands on me I'm talking about people with faith connecting with me. Somebody connected with me. Now, I'm going to tell you what's interesting about this. This woman, through faith, touched the hem of his garment, received her healing. Power left out of Jesus. The moment her fingers touched the hem of his garment, that was the connection. That was just like plugging a socket uh, into the wall socket and getting the power needed to operate the appliance 
or the thing that is needed to have power. When she touched them, she made a connection. That connection was what Jesus came to bring to the children of God, to connect them, reconnect them, as it were, back with the Father, to reconnect them back in right relationship with God the Father. He sent Jesus to be the one to show them how to reconnect to God the Father. And that demonstration of that woman touching his garment, he felt the virtue power leave out of his body going into that woman and stopped the flow of that blood, dried it up immediately. That woman knew that moment she was healed when she touched him. Jesus knew she was healed the moment he, she touched him. He said, who touched me? Look at what the Bible says. And he turned, looking to see her, who, he knew who had touched him, but he wanted her to speak and to share her own convictions and her own faith to solidify totally what he was going to yet do. Listen, her healing was only one part of it. It was only one part of it. And if she would not have acknowledged, she wouldn't have gotten the second part of it. And see, a whole lot of you all stop short of your privilege, stop short of your blessing, stop, stop short of the completion of what God wants to do in your life for just settling for a miracle. Too many of us want the miracle and not the Messiah. If I get a miracle, that's a one-time situation. But if I got the Messiah, it's an everyday, every situation kind of situation. He's there every day, in every way, for everything. When I have the Messiah. And so she opens her mouth and confesses all the truth. And that means very simply, she told him all about her troubles. And she told him all of the stuff that the narrator, the narrator told us about her and all that she experienced. She told Jesus. But what was most impressive was the fact that she believed in Jesus. And here's Jesus' response. Here's his response. Don't miss this. And he said unto her, daughter, pause. There are three things that I want you to get out of this word, daughter. Too many of us rush through scripture, don't check the meaning and see deeply what it means. Daughter, 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 daughter. The first thing daughter meant when he said that to this woman was a term of endearment, a term of endearment. In other words, he said daughter, as a father would say to his child, lovingly, with a sense of pride. The term of endearment, daughter, gave vent to the fact that she belonged she was a part of the kingdom. Notice the narrator said there was a woman with the issue of blood. It didn't say there was a daughter with the issue of blood. There is a great difference between woman and daughter. And the fact that she was a woman was a general description of her, but a daughter was a specific description of her 
meaning she belonged to somebody. And so when he said daughter, it, it, it enveloped her in a sense of belonging. So that was a term of endearment. But, but the second meaning, scholars suggest, when he says daughter, is a time of enlightenment. Because she was a daughter, and that was a term of endearment, because she was a daughter, he meant now there's a time of enlightenment. Let me bring you into the knowledge of what just happened. Notice he says, daughter, thy faith uh -huh. hath made thee whole. Yes, sir. He explained to her that while she was thinking it was him only, he had to explain to her that it was her also. That they collectively connected. In other words, she needed the faith to get the power. He had the power, but she had to have the faith to release it. And so it was a joint effort, a team effort. It was a picture and portrait of what Jesus came to do, and that was to connect them, his people, with what his father wanted, and that was to return them back to the place of blessedness, of wholeness, of completeness, of being his children. And so Jesus enlightens her he takes the time to enlighten her because here's what she needed to know and this is the reason why Jesus takes the time to enlighten her because he knew that she was going to need her faith again Th this was just one situation now she wouldn't need her faith for this situation but how many of you know she would have other situations that she would need her faith for and Jesus needed her to know that even when you don't see me and even when you can't touch me, you still need faith to access the blessings that come through me. Am I talking to anybody in the house? You may not physically be able to go and put your hands on the hem of Jesus' garment to get your healing, but guess what? You don't need to touch the hem of his garment. All you need to do is have faith in him and his word and believe that when you speak it, it's going to be done according to that same said word and your faith. Your faith is mixed with the word. You become a participant in the process. And the same thing that happened for her who had to touch his garment will happen for you because you touched him in the more greater way and that's through your faith without touching him. And so he wanted to enlighten her. Your faith, your faith, your faith. The very thing that you're going to need from this point forward you're going to need it in other situations. You're going to need it every day. The just shall live by faith. Jesus knew he wasn't going to be long with her. So he was trying to help them understand how to use this faith even when they didn't see him. And so this woman knew now, I can use my faith. It's my faith that gained me access. It's my faith that gave me the ability to get close to him. It was my faith that authorized my healing. Come on, and then thirdly, uh -huh. when he said, daughter, it was a time of truth of enlightenment. Truth of enlightenment. Term of endearment time of enlightenment 
and truth of entitlement. Truth of entitlement. Well, what does that mean, the truth of entitlement? The fact that he said daughter suggested again that she belonged to the house of Israel, that she was a daughter of God, that the very reason Jesus came down to planet Earth was to save her, to heal her, to deliver her, to bless her with all of the blessings that her heavenly father wanted for the people of God to receive. And that meant that she was entitled. She was entitled meant that it already belonged to her. Now, I don't want you to miss this part because some of you now who belong to God, who are in the family of God, are entitled to every blessing in Christ Jesus that originally belonged to the Jews. Now that you are a child of God, every blessing, every healing, every deliverance, Everything that Jesus came to offer to the lost house of Israel in return, returning them back to God now belongs to you. You are entitled. If you don't get your healing, it's not Jesus' fault. If you don't get your blessing, it's not Jesus' fault. If you don't get your deliverance, it's not Jesus' fault. If you don't get the things that you think you ought to get, it's not his fault because it already belongs to you. You are just not activating your faith to receive it in your life. You are entitled as a child of God. And I think a whole lot of us miss it. We miss it. We miss it. I'm entitled. It belongs to me. What does entitlement mean? You remember the prodigal son, don't you? When he went to his father and said, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. Now, he was entitled to his portion under Hebrew law of his father's ass assets his assets. And so the older or eldest brother would get a double portion, but all of the other sons would be divvied up the rest of the portions in their proper portion. So from his birth, he had a portion divvied up and waiting on him, which he would have received when his father died. But because he was in, thank you, Chris, he was what? Entitled. He said, I'm not going to wait till my dad die. I want to go and live now. Father, give me. Notice, notice, notice the assertion and the authority in which he asks his father. He doesn't ask him like he don't know it don't belong to him. He's like, you know what you got for me, Daddy? Give it to me. I'm ready for it. And guess what his father did? <laughs> he gave it to him. Now, some of us would have said, oh, no, uh-uh. No, sir. No, you ain't ready. But he was a man. And under law, he could have done that, and he did that. But it's because he knew what he was entitled to. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time you went to God in prayer and prayed like you knew you were entitled? I, I'm not talking about like a beggar asking of alms. I'm talking about a child of God. 
You are of the royal family. You belong to God. You have a right to what you, listen, it's a difference when you want something from somebody you don't belong to versus that that you do belong to. You have a right to go in. You can't go in your friend's uh, house and go in their refrigerator and get what you won't like talking about unless they've accepted you as a member of the family. But you can't do But when you're in your own house, you ain't got to ask to go into the refrigerator and do it so unless you go in there and stand in there and they tell you, get out the refrigerator, shut the door. you letting all the cold air out. But when you know what you want, you can just go in and do what? Get it. Jesus was helping her to understand she was entitled. And that's the message I'm trying to get to the saints of God this morning. Stop acting like a beggar with your heavenly father and act like a child of the king. You are royalty in the kingdom of God. You belong to God. If you belong to God, you ought to look like you belong to God. You ought to act like you belong to God. You ought to have like you belong to God. You are entitled. So I need you to see this. What entitled her was the fact that he said, go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Go in peace. Why? Because you are entitled. Now, there are several words I'm going to do and I'm through. The first one I have to do with, a uh, second one rather, because the first one was daughter. But uh, faith is the very obvious one. Faith is the substance of things, hope for the evidence of things like what? See, we've already experienced that. Six verse of 11, Hebrew says, but without faith, it is impossible to what? Please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So this woman did all of that and she got her blessing, her healing, her deliverance, even though she was entitled. But the next word I want you to look at is whole. Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. There the word whole appears twice in this text. But they are two different definitions. If you look them up, they actually mean two different things. They are two different words. I reminded the people of God when the King James Version was printed in the 1600s, uh, there were only 6,000 words in the English language. Uh, in the Hebrew and Greek, there were 12,000 words, which meant there were more words in the Hebrew and the Greek than there were in the English language, which meant that one word in the English language had to suffice for multiple definitions that were of the Hebrew and Greek. So therefore, when you have one word, that's why you have multiple many times definitions. But this is not just the case in this case. This is a totally different word altogether, not just definitions. So the first whole had to do with healing. It had to do with being complete. It had to do with receiving something that was part now made complete. Uh -huh. that, that's the first whole, W-H-O-L-E. But the second whole, go in peace and be whole of thy plague, is the second whole, which means be safe, be saved, 
and be delivered. Two different words in the one word hold. Two different meanings. Two things happen in the first whole, W-H-O-L-E, she got healed. Uh -huh. Healed. In the second word, whole, W-H-O-L-E, she got saved. All right. All right. Yep, yep. See, <laughs> she came for a healing and left with a healing and salvation. She got more than she came there for when she connected completely with Christ and found out, well, let me put it another way. The first hole represented her faith. The second hole represented grace. She was saved by faith through grace. Y'all ain't hearing me here today. She, she got more than she bargained for because she wouldn't settle for what was trying to settle in her. And if I can wake the people of God up and help you to realize your blessing is not, listen, you are not waiting on your blessing. Your blessing is waiting on you. You have got to come to the point where you said enough is enough. I've been at the back of the line too long. I need, I want, I will have my blessing now. And it isn't until your faith rises to that point where you're ready to say, God, it's mine. The W.G. Winthrop, it's my money. Oh, come on, you don't know the Bible, but you know that, don't you? And I want it now. That's how you ought to feel about your blessings. That's how you ought to feel about your breakthrough. That's how you ought to feel about your deliverance. That's how you ought to feel about the word of God. And I'm closing when I tell you that three things happened with the woman. First, Jesus rescued her hope. He rescued her hope. Well, how do you say he rescued her hope, Pastor? Because he was her last hope. She spent all her family, had no friends, was departed from her family, couldn't be with her family. She was separated from civilization and social uh, contact. And the last bit of hope was in Jesus Christ. You see, you've got a bit of advantage over her. Jesus don't have to be your last hope. He can be your first hope. Hal Lindsey said, man can live 40 days without food, three days without water, up to four minutes without air, but he can't live one second without hope. And my brothers and sisters, if you don't have Jesus, I said, if you don't have Jesus, no wonder you have no hope because Jesus is the hope of the world. And so this woman knew that if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I will be whole. And she didn't know about the second hole. She just knew about the first hole. But for 12 long years, she had been broken. She had been sick. She was in pain. She was in separation. She was moaning and grieving. Uh, she had issues underneath her skin. And I don't know how you feel about it, but every now and then, it's just good to have somebody to touch or be touched by. I wish I had a witness here. And I'm so glad that if somebody can't touch you, it's good for you to be able to touch somebody. 
So every now and then, I don't know, sometime when you may feel lonely and you ain't got nobody around you, at least when you come to church, you ought to have somebody you can touch. I wish I had a witness here. Can't you feel the joy that a touch brings, that a hug brings, that an embrace brings? Can't you feel the love that's transferred from one touch to another? Can't you feel when somebody shakes your hand and you really know they mean it, it sends a charge all through your body because it was a touch that was real. For 12 long years, nobody touched her. And you know women are more sensitive than men. A touch means more to a woman than anything else. I wish I had a helper in the house. Yeah. It's not always a touch of intimacy, but a touch of care, a touch of concern, a touch of I'm here for you, a touch of you can lean on me. And Jesus represented that hope. But not only that, but Jesus not only rescued her hope, but he restored her health. 12 long years. I don't know how you feel about it. Have you ever had a trouble, a pain, a problem that you've been dealing with? You've gone from doctor to doctor to doctor. They might give you a prescription. They might give you some medicine. They might give you some therapy, but the problem still persists. They can help you, but they can't hear you. Jesus restored her health. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God for Jesus. And not only that, not only did he rescue our hope, not only did he restore her help, but thirdly, he restarted her history. Woo! Don't the Bible say, for if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. He restarted her history. She don't have to look in the past. She don't have to live in the past. She's got a new start, a new walk, a new talk, a new testimony. Yay! Yay! Oh! Thank God somebody here today needs a new start. Jesus can give you a new start. Every day he loads your day with brand new benefits. A new day, a new day. A new start is coming your way. Give God praise. The doors of the church are open. There's somebody today 
There's somebody today who needs to know that Jesus can rescue your hope. You might have been going through some stuff and been going through it so long that hope is slipping away like it won't change. It won't get better. But I recommend Jesus. He can rescue your hope and save. Maybe some of you need your health restored. And you've gone to the doctor. And you've gone to those who are able to help, but none has healed. But then there's some of you in the house today who just need a new start. For him to wipe the slate clean and beginning today, Start life over for you in him. See, just because you've been a church member don't mean you've been a believer in Christ Jesus. It's only in Jesus Christ that your life is restarted. Your history is restarted. All that has been all that you've gone through, all that's been done is old news to him. When you come to him, when you repent, when you confess and accept his plan of salvation, you become a new creation. If you're a new creation, that means you have a new history now. His word declares the old things are passed away. He's released them from you, so you release them from you. Stop holding on to that old stuff that's carrying you back into the past, holding you down, keeping you hostage to what you used to be, where you have been, and release you to who you are now and where you are going. The doors are open, come on, this is your time to say, Jesus, here I am. I accept you. I release me afresh to you. The doors are open. Whoever you are, my brother, my sister, you're not here by accident. The spirit of the living God providentially has drawn you here for a reason bigger than you bigger than your past and your future depends on him and you're connecting to him is there one today come on saints pray there's somebody here today God is speaking to and I believe they're ready for a new start. I believe they're ready to lay down all their burdens and take on the love and joy of Jesus Christ. This is your time. This is your time. Make no mistake about it. Can't nobody do it for you but Jesus, but Jesus. Oh, it is Jesus. Wonderful Jesus. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. in my soul touched mm. our last appeal is that one is that one is that one <laughs>
Glory to God. Glory to God. The Spirit of the living God says there are five people who have come with an expectation in their hearts so deep that God led you here this day to be challenged, to be changed, so you can conquer your situation. Remain in that seat and leave out here the same way you came. Or get out of that seat and be changed and leave out of here on a whole new level of life. He knows who you are and he knows your name. Don't be afraid, don't be ashamed. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed even now except those who are praying and watching for me at the altar for you to get up and come. Your blessing is dependent upon your obedience. Would you come just as you are today? Just as you are. Get up out of five people God's dealing with. I don't know what your issue is. I don't know what your problems are. But he knows. Five. Five. Right now. Come on, get up out of that seat. Get up with authority. Get up out of that seat. Don't come as no beggar. Come as an entitled person of the Lord. If you belong to him, come get your blessing. Come get your breakthrough. Come get your deliverance. Come get your healing. Come get what God has for you. Don't let the enemy keep you there in fear and shame. This is your time. This is your time. I wouldn't have the word of God speak to my heart clearly and plainly as the noonday sun and then not obey him. Come on, glory to God. Come on, come on, come on. This is your time. You can't be responsible for no one but yourself. Come on now, come on. Saints are praying for you all over the building. Believing God for you. I'm believing God for you. I'm praying to God for you. Come on, this is your time. This is your time. Glory to God. Glory. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, saints. You can do better than that. This is the work of God. God is calling his people back to himself. We've been in derision too long. We, we have a God who can and who will. But we've got to let him know we know who he is and who we are in him. This is your time. Don't let the devil steal it from you. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. You've got the freedom to get up. You've got the freedom to come get your blessing. You've got the freedom to walk in that peace. Oh, it is Jesus. Come on, choir. Oh, it is Come on, he's not through blessing. Thank you for those who have been obedient. He's not through blessing. Come on, come on, come on. In my, in my soul. Oh, oh, oh. I have touched the. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And his blood, nothing but his blood has made me whole. Oh, 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 oh. oh <laughs> Look at the Lord. Look at the Lord. Look at the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. It's Jesus in my, in my. Whoa, oh, oh, oh. 
touched the hill of his soul. Yeah, Lord, yeah, Lord, yeah, Lord. And he is. One more time, let's take it on up to the top. Stop the music. Bring it out loud to the Lord. Oh, it is Jesus. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. For I have touched. Anybody touched today? Hey, him of his Hey. And his blood has made me. Oh, nothing but the blood of Jesus, nothing but the blood of Jesus. One more time. I thank you for the blood, Jesus. Thank you for the blood. Give him praise in the house today. Come on, give him praise in the house today. Shout glory. glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord.